For those who see the world not as it is, but as it can be, who seek to make their vision of the future become reality, their mission is our mission. At Lockheed Martin, we never forget who we're working for. Thank you, Randy. It's great to be here with all of you today. And I must say, I only wish that I had this opportunity when I was going through school. It would have helped. The comment on the, <laughs> the, comment on the school advisor actually was true. I came from New Bedford, Massachusetts, and the counselor there, when I was preparing to go to college, said there was no future in science nor engineering. My folks had a small restaurant, said you have to go to the hotel school in Cornell, and that's where I started and spent a year and a half. So I would suggest that listen to your counselors very carefully, but hopefully you have some very good ones, one that has a little bit more background at this point. After about a year and a half in the hotel school, I decided I really did want to become an engineer that the future sounded very exciting in engineering. And um, I went to transfer from hotel to engineering. At that time, most students were going from engineering to hotel. So it took about 30 minutes to convince the student advisor that I wanted to make the switch in the other direction. We just were back at Cornell uh, yesterday, actually and mention that, and the, now the feeling is much more, and I think you'll find it, that the effort is really to keep students in school, not to allow them to have issues that don't get dealt with. So when hopefully you enter some STEM field, that you will find that indeed uh, you're getting a lot of support at the university level. In any case, I went on to uh, MIT for a graduate degree, stayed on to teach there for seven years, and wrote a textbook on digital communications. And the whole field was just developing information theory. Everybody thought it was interesting theory, but it would never be practical. We did have an opportunity, I did with a co-author, to write a first textbook on digital communications, claiming that indeed there was going to be very useful to people. And it's turned out that way. We decided to move to California and you're gonna hear a number of changes in my life, and again, I think you're all gonna experience the same thing, that there are many changes, the world keeps changing, and one keeps making changes to kind of do some optimization or have some fun. In case, we moved to California to teach at the University of California, San Diego, which was brand new at that time. But then I had a large number of requests for consulting. You typically, as a professor, consult a day a week, and as a result, um, when I couldn't handle that, the mentioned that to a couple of friends from UCLA. They said, let's start a company. And that's how my very first company, Qualcomm, was started. So I started my first company called Linkabit. We can tell it was uh, not planned with kind of a cute name there. But we ended up doing a large number of different projects. And the first one of which was a program with DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The ARPANET, a packet switch network, had just been developed. They wanted to extend that to Europe, and we took over the task of adding a satellite communication link to take it to Europe. A few years later, people developed the internet protocol, and that satnet and the ARPANET and one other packet radio network were the first three networks to ever be connected using the internet. And so we uh, did that, I think it was in 77, and we just a few years back celebrated the 30th anniversary. It's something that happens you don't expect, you don't think too much about, but it does have obviously a major impact over time. We did a number of other interesting products. Our approach to life is to take advantage of engineering and changes that are occurring, and try to do innovative things. Try to do things that aren't just small improvements, but are significant improvements. And so the upper middle is a unit, a satellite terminal to go in aircraft. And it was the first such equipment to use a microprocessor to do all of the signal processing. 
that was something that hadn't been done up until that time to use software rather than hardware. We end up with a very large uh, manufacturing contract be be because of that, and that ended up really making Lincolnbit quite successful. Our first commercial product was a small antennas to uh, initially allow Schlumberger to allow their people at the oil drilling sites to send data back to the different customers and let them decide whether to continue drilling or not. We morphed that into a small terminal. The first major customer was Walmart, and they used it to connect all their stores and warehouses and end up with a very efficient inventory system. And they still claim that that indeed has played an interesting factor in their success. And another product had to do with scrambling TV signals from satellite to home, and that ended up, again, being a very major product uh, supporting all the cable companies as well as home uses. So Linkabit uh, went uh, ahead very well, but we sold it. I stayed on until 85 and retired, actually on April Fool's Day of 85. And um, stayed retired for about three months, but decided there's just too many things happening in the world and that we'd go ahead and start another company called Qualcomm. And at that time, Linkabit had grown about 50 or 60% every year, had been profitable, didn't expect to be able to do that again, didn't have a particular product in mind when we started, but thought digital, wireless, something would come up. And in fact, very shortly after starting, came up with the idea of using what's called code division multiple access, I won't go into the technical details, but CDMA, uh, for mobile communications. And it sounded very promising, but we didn't have the funding to proceed at that point, again, being a small company with a relatively few people. And so we needed to go ahead and first launch a, another product called Omnitrax, which was, again, a satellite communication, but for the trucking industry. And you often see trucks with little satellite terminals on which allow the drivers to communicate back and forth and to get position location. Of course, we somewhat destroyed that business over the years by providing cell phones with great data capabilities, and so now more and more of that is transitioning over to data, but it was very important to help the trucking industry for many, many years. Well, then we, uh, once we had sold the first such product, we were able to come back and think about CDMA again. The cell phone industry was just beginning to grow significantly. Uh, it originally had used FM radios, basically, for cellular. It had been invented at Bell Telephone Laboratories, which was part of AT&T. Back in the mid-'80s, AT&T went out to a consultant to get a feeling for how big this area of cellular communications might become. And they were told that maybe by the year 2000, there'd be a million users. In fact, that was off by a factor of 100. But because of that, AT&T never did go into the manufacturing of handsets. They just had very poor information. The uh, industry did begin to grow, and everybody recognized that you had a transition from the FM radio, from analog, over to digital communications. And there was a big battle between two forms, TDMA and FDMA, time division, frequency division. We came along after a vote was in favor of going with TDMA to say that CDMA was really a better way to go. Nobody wanted to hear that. And so what do you have to do? And you need to build a demonstration unit to show that the claims for CDMA indeed could be uh, 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 demonstrated in practice. The problem, uh, and the reason people were interested was that CDMA had the ability to offer initially 10 to 20 times the number of subscribers you could put on a given antenna, a cell site antenna, in a given amount of radio spectrum, whereas the TDMA that had been selected was only a factor of three. So much larger number of subscribers, therefore economically makes a lot more sense. 
And so we had some support from the carriers in doing this. That's a picture of our first mobile telephone, CMA telephone. And we invited a number of people in to show that we had solved the problems that other people said were not possible in CDMA. And in doing that, uh, just as I was ready to send everybody out to hear the calls from both ends, I had somebody waving in the back of the room saying, keep talking. And that turned out to be uh, one of the great advantages of having been a university professor. You often talk for 50 minutes, I spoke for another 50 minutes. Lucky I got a hand wave that said it was all right to go ahead. So we were, were able to demonstrate that CDMA did work. That got a lot of interest, but that obviously is not a commercial sized telephone. And so the next step is to develop the chips that allow you to make a commercial sized phone. And that requires a lot of time and a lot of money we went out and raised money by licensing the technology to people, to manufacturers who would take a risk that this would be commercial, and they were pressed to do so by the operators who wanted to get this greater capacity. So we were able to get funding in by licensing and went ahead and developed the chips that then powered the phone. One reason a lot of other people had not gone into it is that they thought using the technology that was today's technology when they were looking at it, that it was too complicated. But what's happened in the electronics industry is something called Moore's Law, which is really an observation that was made back in 1965, that roughly every two years or so, one can double the number of transistors on a piece of silicon. And that has now gone on, still going on. There are probably at least three more generations to go through. And so whereas at the time he made that prediction, there were about 40 transistors on a piece of silicon. Now there are in the order of 4 billion transistors, all of which use less power, use, uh, go faster, and cost much less, obviously. And that's enabled today's smartphone, today's telephone that gives us so much capability. That phone, we think of as a phone, but probably you don't use it very much for speaking anymore. You use it for internet connections, for texting, for all kinds of other aspects. But it has a very strong global positioning system, so you can determine your location, use mapping programs. It has great graphics. You can play games on it. It has all types of capabilities, ability to receive TV and now this latest 4K television, and also take those pictures all fitting on one little chip because of Moore's law. And so that allows one to continue to develop, opens up all kinds of interesting possibilities for the future. Now there are about four billion, I'm sorry, about seven billion cellular connections today, but that number is expected to go up to the 20 billion by 2020 or even higher because of what's called the internet of things, that most things are going to be able to have internet connections on them. And so cars, I think you've heard a lot about, energy both at the source of production, transmission, at the home, all these things will end up with wireless connections. Your thermostats will be wirelessly connected. We even have a little collar for dogs that allow you to track the dog, set an electric, electronic fence, and the dog will send you an email if it goes outside, or a text if it goes outside that electronic fence. So lots of things are happening. The technology keeps moving ahead, and now something called augmented reality. That's where you often see on television when you're watching uh, the line of scrimmage and the first down line appear to be on the field, but of course that's just augmented reality. It's done on the TV set. But now one can do many other things. For example, you're in a country, can't read a sign, hold up your phone. It will interpret that sign and at least allow you to read it. You can go into a room see someone, try to remember their name when you get to my age, that gets exceedingly hard. Hold up your phone, it will recognize that person and give you a name and then you can kind of look as well and see what uh, the last few contacts with, were with her. And that of course is almost available today. So these things keep moving very, very quickly. Because of having all the 
wireless connections available, we set up a program called Wireless Reach. And it now has about 105 projects that we work with partners in different countries and in a whole range of different areas. Uh, one of them, microfinance, providing initially phones, now lots of applications like banking applications, so that women who typically are the ones who buy these and then pay them back in about six months are able to earn lots of income. So the wireless enables that quite well. In having remote clinics, one can have equipment available, wireless connections back, and again, have much better treatment. The latest one is a ultrasound for women who are pregnant, a little mobile device, talks about allowing the data to be sent back from the mobile device to the hospital or a doctor, look at it, most of the time, hopefully all is well, get that information back, but if not, immediately get back information about treatment that's needed. And so the wireless is beginning to take over lots of different areas. A uh, more recent uh, technique that we've um, uh, come up with now, let's see if I can make this work. Ah. This one is in China for allowing people to be able to check their uh, uh, heart, see if they have a heart problem. And so again, a little mobile device, and it will give you information about how to use it, and then make some measurements itself, and then relay those uh, measurements back to, again, a doctor, and allow many people to be screened very rapidly. So it's going through its things. I'm not going to wait. It's asking me now to send the information back. A, um, another area, and this is uh, Qualcomm very early became interested in the whole health, health area, set up something called Qualcomm Life. Shush. not going to pay attention to me. Okay. Um, one of the areas that we had come up with is a way of providing communications from the um, different medical devices, all of which typically talk with different protocols, different types of information, be able to gather those together in a little device that you can plug in the wall, get that information, send it back to your cell phone, send it out to uh, a network for, again, further analysis. Now that's been further improved, and so one has the ability to take these different devices and use a cell phone itself, if I, oops, get this one to be behave. So these are one of these oximeters and a phone to allow it to see what is happening. And again, it transfers the information to the phone. There's also a thermometer one could use, and et cetera. So you immediately get that information, which can again be networked. Thermometer that can be used. One of the more interesting cases now was done by a neuroscientist at uh, done some graduate work at Salk, uh, got his PhD, and now has done some areas where puts a little device on your forehead that can measure your EEG and then provides stimuli to see what might be happening. And so, for example, let me just do a migraine visual test. Get my hands out of the way here. I probably have to push something here. Start. So it's going to flash a number of pictures. And while those pictures are flashing, you're looking at them. The device is measuring your EEG and then can make analysis as to whether there are problems or not. So there are tests for a whole number of different neuro diseases that come up. So all types of additional capabilities that are becoming available, and we're just at the beginning. 
So lots of excitement in this whole medical area. Let me just finish up. Uh, we're also, of course, able to use these devices for education, mobile devices, finally are beginning to make a difference in education. And one of the things that Qualcomm has done is been working with online education, education can have 24 seven. And for about 200, I think we only had 200 of these, but on the way out, if you wish, you can get one of these brochures. It will give you free access to a variety of different courses and you can pick one of those courses and actually get credit for that. Thank you all very much, and I think we have a little time for Q&A.